Welcome back to another video. This is the Compact Portable from 1983. It has an 8088 microprocessor, no built-in hard drive, and I featured it in a number of my videos. But today, I want to introduce you to its little brother, the Compact Portable 2. In the Compact Portable line, there was the original, the name later given as the Portable 1, then there was the Portable 2, and after this came a Portable 3. So the Portable 2 is what we're looking at today. Now this little guy was headed to be recycled, uh, pulled out of an e-cycling center, and now it's here on the bench. So let's take a look at this thing, see if it works, see what's inside, and if it doesn't work, let's see if we can't fix it. So that's right, today we'll be looking at the Compact Portable 2. So uh, I've already shot the first part of this video and it was quite long, um, but I thought it was pretty interesting, hopefully to people to see how I do troubleshooting and how I, you know, kind of go through the process of figuring out what's wrong uh, and then a daily making the repair to fix the system there. So I left a lot of video in. Um, if you know how to troubleshoot or you're not interested, you know, feel free to, uh, fast forward to the end and see what kind of progress you made but um, this will be a two-parter because this is a lengthy repair but anyway hope you stick around hope you uh, learn something and i hope you enjoy now on with the video all right so i got the portable two here on its side now um, i can see some marks in the case it looks like somebody had at some point at least tried to get into it i don't know if they were successful but i'd give it a try so let's first pull open the keyboard see what we have in here. All right, well, we have um, parts of the keyboard cable that are flaking off. That's interesting. A lot of them are flaking off. But what we do have is apparently the original hard drive, which was type two, and the original five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Um, we have the amber monitor. Uh, I believe it's amber. I think all of them are amber. And then we have the standard uh, foam and foil keyboard, which probably doesn't work anymore. But we can fix that. Put the keyboard back on here. Turn it around to the side here. We can open up this door. This is the power supply. The portable one had room for the power cord inside this bay. Um, this one's a little smaller, doesn't have that. And then on the other side, we should have access to the expansion cards. And I can see that we have what appears to be a parallel port, a serial port, probably CGA graphics port, and probably composite video out. And it looks like these two are just uh, empty slots. So nothing super special in here. And on the bottom side, we do have this, which is used as stand so you can tilt it up when it's sitting down so you're not trying to peer into it. So the portable one just had the uh, legs that came down but portable two has this whole contraption made out of uh, plastic. I'm surprised this one's in as good shape as it is but all right so I think the first thing we want to do before we try to power this on is pop it open Make sure there's not like a rat's nest inside or something uh, horrible and then uh, we can go from there. All right so as you can see here somebody thought the way to open this case was to pry this panel open. There's uh, you know, some marks in it and stuff but that's how you open the portable one but the portable two opens slightly differently. Let me show you how to do it. So inside each of these doors there are torque screws which you need to take out. So I think the Portable 2 is where Compaq's love of Torx bits started and continued all the way through until and after HP bought them. Anybody who's worked on any Compaq ever knows that Compaq really does love their Torx screws. And then in the other door here, we've got two more. So with these four screws out, we 
you should be able to just pull the entire case off. Um, what I think you need to do is close these first so they don't get in the way on both sides. And then I should just lift right off. It's actually falling apart from the damage from the previous person trying to open it incorrectly. So I'm not sure if that person ever managed to get into this machine or not. Um, I do see some dead bugs and things in here. Um, it's a little dusty, but not in terrible shape. So what I'm going to do now is take this cover off so that we can see what the card bay looks like. That should give us a good indication of the state of the rest of the machine. And again, it's a uh, Torx as well. So these screws you don't need to take out all the way. You just need to loosen them a little bit. And the cover does actually just slide out of the way. And there's going to be three on top here. And we've got three in the back as well. I'll spin it around so you can see that. those out oh, we should be able to slide this oh there's one more on the side as well so slide this out that should just pop right out all right well let me bring the camera down here and i'll give you a shot of the inside of the machine all right so looking in the machine we have the controller card here for the hard drive and the floppy drive, I believe. Everything's here. Um, we have the video controller card, which is the one that had the probably CGA and probably uh, composite output. And it's also got this connector down here to run the internal monitor. So that's the video signal going to the built-in display. Um, but as you can see from the board, it's actually quite clean. So if this is stored with the handle facing up, which it probably was, this would have been at the top. So I wouldn't expect a ton of dust to gather up here, but it's really quite, quite clean in general. So I think at this point I am willing to just power it on and see what happens. So let's get, a, let's get that set up and give that a try. So a couple of pieces of plastic did fall out. These were the clips that were holding the case together. Um, I think I'll try to glue these back on with some super glue and baking soda so we'll do that at the end so that we can rebuild the case correctly so yeah i'm not sure if the person that was trying to get into this case ever actually did get into this case what i did find is that behind the panel where the stand comes out this is the actual space where you can store a power cord or something else but so i take retract my previous statement about it not having a power cord a storage compartment it does it's on the bottom all right well let's go ahead and Make sure it's switched off, it is. Plug in the power. And let's give it some juice. Ooh, my power supply is not starting up. It's trying to, but it's not. It's making some fun sounds. So here we have our main power supply. And what's interesting about the power supply is there's only three pins coming out of it. So we've got a connector here with just two wires, positive and negative. So this runs in. Oh, okay, duh. This just runs the fan. So the fan's getting power. Um, this slot edge connector here is where it's actually feeding into the rest of the power supply. And those could be any number of voltages on there. Hard to say what exactly it's putting out. So I'm curious. I don't remember the, if the fan spun up before or not. Let's just go ahead and plug the fan back in. Plug 
plug this in. Carefully give it some juice. All right, well, the fan's running now. But I think when everything was plugged in, the fan was not running. So I think that might indicate that there is a problem with a short somewhere on the board and the power supply is simply shutting off as a safety measure. So let me slide this back in to that edge connector. And do this test again. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it does, definitely isn't giving power out when the edge connector is connected, but it is when it's not. So again, I don't believe that's a problem with this board. So I kind of probably wanted to leave that connected. Um, so to troubleshoot this, I want to disconnect as much as I can one at a time to see, well, I want to disconnect everything and then reconnect things one at a time if uh, I get it to a working point. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take out the uh, video controller board. It's a pretty simple board, pretty long though. And then I'm going to take out the hard drive and floppy controller, along with the parallel port and serial port. I'll try to leave the cables connected. If they reach, I'm not sure they will. I don't think they will. That. I think that's the LED. All right, so this is our parallel serial hard drive and floppy controller. We got that out. Next, I'm going to disconnect both of the drives, the hard drive and the floppy drive from power. They're already disconnected from the board, but now they're electrically disconnected as well. Let's go ahead and plug this power supply back in, back into its edge connector slot. Let's see what we get now. Same thing. So it appears none of those were the faulty component. So I guess that leaves either the power supply for the monitor or the board itself. Now this board does have a lot of tantalum caps on it, so it's likely that one or more of those has failed, and those typically fail short, which would be the exact problem we're seeing here. All right, and with that, our board is free. All right, so here it is. Here is the uh, board from the Compact Portable One. Let's see if we can see what's on it. Looks like these are the, uh, the ROM BIOS. I don't know what that chip would be. Here is the 286 processor, it's 8 megahertz. We've got two 8-bit and two 16-bit ISA slots. This is where the drives get their power from. And uh, yeah, this is the populated RAM here. I forget what these shipped with, but um, I don't believe it was a lot of RAM. And it's using all NEC chips and they're all socketed, so if there is a problem with the RAM, it would be fairly easy to fix. All right, so the power supply for the monitor gets its voltage from the system board. So the power supply hooks up into here, 
and then the monitor power supply takes its voltage from this connector. Um, what else do we have up here? We had contrast, or sorry, brightness, and I think the speaker were here, and this is the uh, keyboard connector. So if I uh, had a pinout of these, we could see if the 12 volt rail was shorting, which could be any of these uh, tantalum caps that are on here. There's quite a number of them. But I think what we can do instead is look at the uh, 12 volt line on the ISA cards and see if we have a short there to ground. All right, so I printed out a handy little guide of the uh, eight bit ISA slot. So we should be able to figure out if there's a short on this board or not. So let me switch this over to continuity mode. And as always, you gotta check them first by touching them together. It's a requirement. You watch any of these uh, retro computing channels, any electronics channel, you always test them. Uh, so it's B1 and B31 are ground. So B1 here should be ground. It is. And B31 should be ground. And it is. So I'm gonna switch this board over so it matches my layout. All right, so B1 over here to ground. B31 is ground. So the address lines are all in this area. Data lines are here. Uh, so let's find 12 volts. Well, let's find, we'll test them all. So pin three, one, two, three. This is minus five volts. Not shorted. We have IRQ2, minus five volts. Minus five volts to ground, we get nothing. Plus five volts. I think I said minus before, but this is plus five volts. We get pretty low value, but I think that's okay. IRQ2, minus five volts. DRQ2, this is minus 12 volts. And not surprisingly, we have like a zero ohm resistance to ground on minus 12 volts. And let's check this one. It's card selected. And this next one is plus 12 volts. So yeah, very, uh, very much, I think, one or more of these uh, tantalums has failed. And that's why the power supply isn't kicking on. Now the trouble is figuring out which one. Uh, sometimes you can go through and it's probably one of the ones on the ISA bus, which probably are these ones here. Um, sometimes you can go through and check them for shorts and whichever one has the lowest resistance is typically the one that's at fault, but they're all showing pretty low resistance. This one here is at zero. That one's at zero. So I think one of these is plus 12 and one of them is minus 12 and they're just all showing as being shorted. Um, I don't believe any of the RAM or anything over here uses 12 volts. Um, some of these could be 12 volts over here, I suspect. That one could be shorted. Move this a little bit. That one could be shorted. That one's okay. So what we can do, there's a couple ways to approach it. We can start cutting legs and testing until we find when the short goes away. We could desolder them. I think these are through holes. I'm very positive they are through holes, so we could desolder them. Um, you always run the risk of ripping pads up and traces up when you desolder. But I'm pretty sure it's just the ISA bus stuff that is causing us trouble here. So my wonder is, does this video card actually have anything connected to 
12 volt rail. So this would go in this way. So let me flip this over and check these pins here. So if not, we can just cut capacitors until the short goes away and then see if the rest of the system is working. So this is the B side here. So it'll be on this side. So we've got ground connected, reset connected, plus five is connected. IRQ2 is not connected, minus five is not connected, DRQ2 is not connected, minus 12 is not connected, card select is not connected, and plus 12 volt, which is seven, is connected, unfortunately. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, I miscounted. Let's start over. Ground, connected, pin, uh, pin two, Reset drive, I think, uh, is connected. Pin three, it's plus five volts is connected. Pin four here, IRQ two, not connected. Minus five, not connected. Uh, minus five is typically only used by the RAM, I think. Uh, then DRQ two, not connected. Minus 12, not connected. Card selected, and yeah, plus 12 is connected. That's pin nine, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, minus 12, eight, nine, plus 12. Where does that go through to? It goes up to this chip. So this chip does need 12 volts to operate, plus 12. Um, if I had another ISA video card, I could try that, but then obviously the internal monitor wouldn't work because we've got that specialized connector here, so that's not really too much of an option. All right, let me just put a mark on all of the capacitors here that are causing around the shorted bus. I think it was those two, right? Yep. Not the middle one. And it was the two edge ones here, I think. Yep. Yep. And not the middle one. So that one, that one, that one, and that one. And then over here it was first one, I think. Not the second one. Third one. And not the fourth one. All right, then I suspect if we check those against the uh, minus 12 and plus 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Video card doesn't use minus 12, so it is not a problem. That's plus 12, plus 12, plus 12, plus 12. Plus 12, plus 12. And over here, plus 12, and plus 12. And oddly enough, that's shorted to minus 12. All right, this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that's minus 12. So this one's connected to that rail, but it's not shorting. Which is interesting. So this, this capacitor is fine. Again, that one is connected to the rail, but not shorted. I think, I feel like uh, it's shorted to ground. It's gotta be shorted to ground. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, okay, it's shorted to ground. <sighs> well, it could be any of them. Check the 
this one over here, this one. So I think we've only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight capacitors that are the potential problem here. Um, the problem is I don't know the values of any of them. And I guess these ones do have values written on them. I definitely don't have any replacements. 10 microfarad, 15 volt. This is a little hard to see here. All right, well, I'm of the mind just to start popping these guys out and seeing when we get rid of the short. Sounds like fun to me. So we get our soldering iron heated up. We get our flux out. And we'll start with the uh, we'll start with the ones closest to where the power comes in. I don't know if that's most likely to have failed. I mean, I think it's likely any of them would have failed. Oh, did we test this one? I think we did. Okay, so there's one more there I missed. three up here. So these two. Let's start with taking these two out here. The first thing I want to do is straighten the legs up just a little bit so it makes them easier to get out. And then I'm going to put a mark on them so I know how to put them back in if they're not the problem. So I'll put a mark on the side with the most components on it. Flux on these guys here. Um, this machine's old enough where this is almost certainly going to be leaded solder, so I shouldn't have to add any fresh solder to it to lower the melting point of it. Um, if it is oxidized, though, for whatever reason, then I may have to add some fresh solder, but I think we'll try without first. Cut off some uh, solder work here and go with a fresh piece. All right, so I think the pin, not on the ground side, comes out pretty clean. It's the pin in the ground plane. I can assume it's the plane. I guess I don't know how many layers this board is. See, that's the problem with desoldering now. It's a trick to get these out sometimes, and you know, you might end up ripping a pad or a trace, which you really don't want to do because that makes your problem even harder to solve. Although, if you rip the trace where the short was, then I guess that would make your problem easier to solve. All right, so let's see if that was the culprit. No way, no way did we get it right on the first try. I think we might have guessed right. Yeah, but that short is absolutely gone. What are the chances we got the right capacitor on our first try? That's uh, very unexpected if that is the case. So kind of what I'd like to do now is 
this, plug this in. Make sure we get this the right way and not flip it upside down. So that would just destroy everything. Now we want to make sure that this is not touching anything in metal. Put this on a box, I think. Should be fairly safe. It's okay to me. Now I don't know how we're going to know if this is working or not. Because there's no fan, there's no uh, nothing to indicate. Okay, so we know it's not working. Power supply still not starting. So there must be something else going on with this board. But we definitely know that it's this board causing us the issue now. Carefully put this back without just zapping myself. Now what else would be shorting on here? Is the question. And I don't, like I said, I don't know the pinout of these. I'm pretty sure this is grown. Because that's the side of the capacitor I was struggling to get out. And this should be 12 volt. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two. Okay, so 12 is still shorted to ground. But the capacitors themselves. Wait, didn't we just test this? And they weren't shorted anymore? I could have sworn we tested this. I could have sworn we tested that. All right. So this capacitor wasn't the problem. So it wasn't the first one. And just to double check, let's just test it while it's out of circuit here. Okay. It is 100% shorter. You know what though? When we applied power to the board, uh, probably what happened is another one failed, it failed short. Sometimes they'll smoke. I think most often they smoke. So I don't know if something happened and I missed it, but I think what happened is that we took this one out of the circuit, power got somewhere else, and another capacitor had failed. So I'm gonna go back to this one again. Let's see if we can't get this one to budge without ripping the via out. All right. So now that one is electrically disconnected from the board. Let's test it for a short. Okay, so it wasn't shorted. But the trace across where it's now not connected to is is still shorted. All right, so we know, at the very least, we found one bad one, and this one apparently is good. Uh, let's see, I think this one was bad as well, right? Well, we don't know if it's bad. It was shorted across this capacitor. So let's work on that one next. going to be which two these two here I'll straighten those legs out that with some flex. Hit with some fresh solder. I'm 
this one seems much more cooperative than those first two. So we have that one out of circuit. See if it was shorted. It was not, but across to the pad we just took out is shorted. So another good, at least for now, capacitor. Well, so let's turn our attention to down here. We've got marks on these three. Short. No, no mark on that one. And that one's short. So let's start with these ones. I'll straighten these legs out. And we'll hit it with some flux. some fresh solder. So that one's electrically disconnected. I might as well do them both here and then we'll test it. Oops. All right, and that one's electrically disconnected. So let's test those two. Okay, so this is another bad one. This one's also bad. So we've got two more bad capacitors here. All right, let's see if the short persists across this one. It doesn't. Not here. Not here. And not here. Let's check to ground. Okay, that all looks good. Only one side's connected to ground on some of those. Not both sides on any of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two. So plus and minus 12 volts no longer connected to ground. So let's give this another try. See if we get power to the board. Put our box back here. Power supply back out. Plug this in, make sure again it's in the right way. If we plug the board in the wrong way, uh, we would just need to throw this machine out. Basically, I think it would short everything out and fry a bunch of stuff. So we got it in the right way. Uh, all right, let's plug some juice in. And let's hit the gas button. All right. So I don't know, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a red light flash in here that is making horrible sounds. The, the light's not making the sounds. I think the power supply is. 
Um, but I don't remember seeing that light up before, so I think that's a new behavior. And that should be the uh, the power on light. Let me readjust this here. All right, so now that we've given power to 12 volt, let's see if there's a short once again. It does not appear to be. I can't test that one here, test up here. All right, and now these ones are shorting, so. We have shorted another capacitor somewhere. Multimeter turned off. Shorted. Not shorted. All right, so we got one of the rails is no longer shorted after applying power, but one of them is shorted again, even though it just wasn't. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So minus 12 volt is not shorted to ground, but plus 12 volt is. And we're down to four capacitors. That could be the problem, I think. Oh no, two, because minus 12 is good. So it's one of these two here. So let's, uh, let's do the same. Start with this one. I'll straighten the leg out. All right, I straighten the other leg out. Apply some flux. And then we'll hit it with some fresh solder, just a little bit. to desolder that. Desoldered pretty nicely, I think. Yeah, it looks pretty clean. Pop that out. There we go. So that should be electrically disconnected. We still have a short, which means this capacitor is likely failed. Um, the one we just desoldered might also be failed. I didn't test it, but we will. Some flux. bit of fresh solder. So we have that electrically deconnected as well now. Let's test for a short. I think I have it deconnected. Let me look at this side. Yep, I do. Let me make sure all these are still unconnected. They are. So with that one removed, well, let's test both of these to see if either of these were the cause of a short. This one. This one was okay. This one was okay. But we still have a short. So that means there's another capacitor somewhere on this rail that has failed short that we did not yet identify. So it could be, like I said, I don't think it's by the RAM. I don't think it's gonna be any of these. And they're all gonna be in parallel, so it's, one's good, they're all good. I would've really thought it was one of these ones by the ISA bus. Okay. So we got one here that's shorted as well. And I'll mark it too. 
and that is a 12 volt capacitor that would send 12 volts to the hard drive and floppy drive. Straighten these pins out. Take this little piece of pin off here. Oh, I lost my capacitor. That one. Straighten this out. As per usual, flux. Got something in my flux here. Same as before, fresh solder. All right. Well, that's now electrically disconnected. So I suspect this one will be short. And it is. Then the short across 12 volts is gone, so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Minus 12 volts, eight, nine. No short. All right, so we once again fixed this board. We fixed this board like at least, what, five times already tonight? It just keeps breaking. All right, back to this. Make sure this goes in the right way. Lights on solid. It made a, a, a funny sound, but the power supply is running. It makes the funny sound when it goes on. So I'm really curious where that noise is coming from. I think somewhere in this area. Oh. So what I do have is a postcard. Well, this is a 286, so it should have postcodes. Unlike the uh, original IBM XT, which I don't believe had postcodes. So I gotta make sure we plug this in the right way too. Um, so this is rear here, so we plug this into one of the ISA slots. And let me move the camera. So I've got the display of what the postcodes will be here. Um, these will be all of the different rails. Now we should see 12 volts, both of them should not be eliminated. Um, we got some speaker wires here, but let's go ahead and switch it on and see if we get any postcodes. And we do. And we can see that oh, both of the 12 volt rails are on. And it's trying to boot, I think. Well, it's trying to post. It's doing things. So I think the code on the left or the one on the top for your angle is the one that is the current code and the one on the right is the old code. I know it also mirrors it here. Um, I don't remember which is which. But uh, I can go look those up and I guess see what they are. But if we put the video card in, um, with those 12 volt lines being illuminated, will it actually do something. I don't know. I'm curious to find out. 
Anyway, we fixed the short. It's posting. This board ostensibly works. Uh, if we were to replace the capacitors, uh, there might be other errors. I don't know what 8C is. It could be no video display, no boot device. Um, I'm not sure what that would be. I can check it out, but uh, it's definitely doing something. It's not completely failing. Um, and that is definitely a plus. All right, so here is my plan. So I've got this uh, monitor I picked up at Free Geek Twin Cities. And it takes a composite image. It's just black and white, but that's okay for this. So I haven't actually tried it out yet. I heard it works really well. Or at least that's what it tells me on top. Now it's only got the uh, the BNC in the back. So I'm going to plug that into in and convert that to these RCA cables. I'll use yellow for video. So assuming that's on, now what I can do is take the video card that came with this machine, plug it into one of these slots here. I'm going to plug my postcode card over in slot one and the video card I'll put into slot two. Now assuming this actually is composite, which I would bet a small sum of money that it is, um, we'll see if we see anything when I give it some juice. All right, and I see a flashing cursor on the screen while the postcodes are running here. It's counting the RAM. Well, the signal is pretty wavy, but that could be because the uh, capacitors are out of circuit. All right, so it's uh, definitely not looking quite right. I don't think that's this monitor, but again, like I said, I hadn't tested it, but it was sold as a very nice picture. So this could be because the uh, the capacitors are out and maybe they were smoothing capacitors or something for 12 volts. Who knows? But it's trying to work and it's reporting a keyboard error. And it wants me to resume by hitting F1. So that is interesting. Um, I'd like to plug the keyboard in and see if anything else happens. So let's do that. Nice. All right. Let's give it some juice. Still making that weird sound. We've got post activity over here. And we can see that we have the cursor. That's counting the RAM. It's really wavy. So it looks like we have 640 kilobytes. Uh, disk got controller error. And system options not set, I believe. So let's hit F1 and see if it actually works here. Oh, it did actually work. So yeah, now I believe it's uh, trying to boot off of the diskette that is not connected to the system. All right, I think it's just going to hang there because there's no disk controller. Oh, there we go. Non-system disk or disk error. So these, uh, don't know if you can actually get into BIOS um, and set anything on these uh, compact portable twos. You might have to boot off of a special configuration disk to actually get it to do anything. But, uh, yeah, that's all super promising. We've got, uh, you know, the postcodes, everything passed here. I believe 99 is booting. So I think 69 was the previous one, and then 99, the one on the right, is the actual current code. But, yeah, we've got, we've got life out of the system. Now, we haven't tested out the monitor yet. We haven't tested out the disk drive or the hard drive. The hard drive, I'd be surprised if it worked, but... Uh, I think the prognosis is looking pretty good for this one. All right, so I think I'm going to have to cut this video here. It's already been, well, I think I've got like two and a half hours of footage already on this thing, and we still got a lot more work to do. So I guess uh, in the words of Adrian Black, this is going to be at least a two-parter. So thanks for hanging out. hope you enjoyed, and we will catch you in part two. Thanks for watching. Hi, guys. Make sure to like and subscribe, and watch more of our videos later. Bye.